Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so, Adam, would you do me the honor of asking me where I'm sitting? Sean, where are you sitting? So this is the first spot, first time of doing this huddle from here. Um, on July 26th of 1920, my grandfather, Pop, was born. So yesterday was, would have been his 100th birthday. And you want to talk about a source of Zeus energy and love, who's my, my blind grandfather. And he was such a remarkable example of possibility in the world, standing in the gap um, for his family at a time when people had to hide their visual disability. He worked for public service. He did not graduate from high school. And he and my grandmother, Nani, um, so his name was Adam Bastek, Pop, you know, Caroline Bastek was my grandmother. They did such an unbelievable job. They were able to put their five children, my mom, you know, her three sisters, my uncle Jimmy, you know, her sisters, my Aunt Diane and uh, Barbara Aunt Denise through private Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school in Jersey City, uh, making virtually no money. And this is the, the swing that I would sit on my whole life, including into my 20s. My grandfather passed away when I was 29, um, including sitting on the swing with him when I was 28 uh, and 29. And it is a beautiful, remarkable place full of magic. Um, and the roots of mastery uh, of self, of overcoming obstacles and challenge, of disruption, lightning bolt. And Adam, everybody out there, you know, Pop stood for the lightning bolt um, and love. The, I mean, the guy, the amount of love he had for his family, children, and showed it openly was absolutely unbelievable. So coming from uh, Long Beach Island, New Jersey today, sitting on uh, Non and Pop Swing. And good morning, Adam, and good morning, Unblinded uh, Ecosystem. Good morning, Sean. Uh, how was your weekend? Yeah. So, you, and Adam, I think you've sat on this swing. Have you not, real quick, or no? Um, I was. You're at I this house. That, yeah. No. No. Yes. Beautiful. And and thank you so much for the uh, the incredible hospitality. I I'm I'm sure I saw it. Yeah, but I'm not no. sure if I sat on it myself. All right. Well, also thank you for your integrity at it. So the weekend was, um, the weekend was incredible. Um, and so how was your weekend? Let's start with you. And how was your weekend, everybody out there? My weekend was incredible. Thank you for asking. I had a great day with my mom and my dad who are no longer together, but uh, we're together on Sunday uh, playing golf and pickleball. So thank you for <laughs> asking. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll leave that one there. But it was a who who a won great who day. won golf, Adam? Who won golf? So my my mom actually my well okay, you really need to hear. My dad got on the pickleball court early in the day, and I told him to simply just you're gonna you're gonna this is gonna you're gonna learn a lot from this, Sean. <laughs> so I asked him to just hit a little volley back and forth. So I hit him one. He backhands it, and I hit it back to him, and all of a sudden he comes running, charging up to the net. He swings. It doesn't bounce like a tennis ball. He misses. He rolls over. He crashes into the oh, net. No. His ear is gushing blood. Oh, my <laughs> God. He's 71 years old. He's got his back. He's holding his back. I'm like, oh, my God, Dad, I was telling you, this is just volley. Just volley. Yeah, but you know, you got to get the ball. You got to get the ball. So. Oh Long story God. short, he doesn't end up playing golf because he hurts his back, and but he did play again. We played pickleball later somehow after I fixed his ear up. I mean, it's just it was a crazy day, but uh, all in all, a lot of fun. And yeah, when you when you first start playing pickleball, just just take it easy. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so that's yeah. That, that was my story. All right, and how? Let's hit in the chat a little bit. How was your weekend? Uh, what was what was fun about the weekend for you? Um, share that energy with the fine folks here. And for me, I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So I flew out, uh, Adam, everybody, and I'm going to lead into our point for today because I had some phenomenal content that came up. And I want to talk about today, leaders leading leaders. And we've been using the phraseology of influencers influencing influencers. 
And I think it's really heart-centered, integrity-based leaders leading leaders and influencing leaders. And I want to talk about that a little bit today because um, without that, nothing happens. And I think so often we find ourselves in a space of if, if folks are in the world, the influencer world, I think a lot of times the people in the influencer world are not leading leaders. They're not leading leaders. And that really came up for me this weekend as I thought through a bunch of things. So for you out there, your takeaway from today is who are you leading? And where are you on the scale of your ability to lead leaders? Not just to get anybody to do something, even if it's in their best interest and totally in integrity, but are you able to have leaders see what they don't see? in integrity, see what they don't see about what you have to offer and why they want to say yes to you, right? So we'll come back to that. So this weekend, um, I flew out on Saturday to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And Jackson Hole is a beautiful and incredible place. And it was the Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership weekend. Friday night was my uh, daughter's prom. Um, my old daughter, Courtney, my younger daughter, Emma, went as well. Uh, she's a junior. Um, and it was beautiful, emotional, incredible, and reminded me how un, like, it's the greatest cliche in the world of like how fast time goes and life goes, but it's utterly and absolutely fundamental to our understanding of our own acceleration to realize how like just time is passing. Like time is passing. And no matter what, you're going to be at next Monday. And no matter what, well, God willing, if you're healthy, like if you're healthy and survive, you'll be at next Monday. And then you'll be in September one, and then you'll be at December one, and then you'll be at January one years over. And then January 1, 2021 will turn into January 1, 2022. And the next thing we know will be 2025 and then 2030. And for a lot of us, we'll make up reasons and excuses of why the things we dreamt of and hoped for and believed in didn't happen. And I heard some things about that this weekend, which I'm going to tie into all this concept of leaders leading leaders, right? Leaders leading leaders. So we go out there, Adam, and everybody, and I was a little bit reluctant. I uh, candidly uh, didn't feel like going. Um, you know, I, I would have said if I was really digging deep and I was going to effectively keep my obligations as a leader um, in the world, leader of this movement, it was a great opportunity to connect with others, a leader in the space of Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership and Lions, and the honor and service of that group and my being a part of it. Um, There's only a small fraction of the entire group that was gonna be going, relatively speaking. And um, I said, I'm gonna go. And so it was about 80 people that went, somewhere between 70 and 80. And the first thing we did is we went, uh, we we're gonna go rodeo barrel racing. Rodeo barrel racing. And uh, most of you know, I'm blind. Uh, literally, legally blind, can't see. And I'm going to be now taking off on a horse and going out and, and racing around barrels that you would see in a rodeo. Like up to the right, like go right, do a circle around the barrel, go across, circle around the barrel, go to the top of the diamond, circle around the barrel, sprint for home. So it's like right, across, over, down, right? So I'm thinking like, okay, this is probably going to be suboptimal for me, but at least perhaps these horses are like really trained and they kind of just do their thing. You just ride them. Well, Adam, that was not the case, brother. So the horses go where you want them to go. And I realized that very quickly because I would, the first turn I made was ridiculously wide. And I, I do have some peripherals. So like looking at this camera, I can't see it. Looking at it here, I can see it. But I, I know there's a post that's like right there. I can't see that post looking straight ahead. I can see it peripherally, but I know there's a far post that's maybe like five more feet past that, I think, but I can't see it. So let's just check. So I have like no optics. On. Yeah, there is. I remember that it was there. I could see it now peripherally, like this post. I can't see this post from sitting on this chair. So I'm only gonna see riding at speed, I'm only gonna see like the thing within like not, not soon enough to make the turn. So, but I realized that there was gonna be a rider with me um, and made some distinctions, which I won't drop into. We could do that at a different day for our vertical innovations and how to do this. I'm like, all right, let's go. So in the practice rounds, I was really comfortable riding really, really fast on the home straightaway because um, that really came down to body awareness and a straight sprint, right? So that my vision wasn't a deficit there. And I had a great horse. 
uh, Sam, but getting through the, the barrel turns from turn you know one, two, and three was was challenging. It was really challenging. So we had like four four practice rounds or so, and I was getting through it, getting through it, getting through it, getting through it, and I kept like having micro distinctions that were off, and I was trying to innovate this process as rapidly as I could because competitively and for, for fun and competition, I wanted to do well. Did you ever feel that way out there? Like, that you, like, where's competition for you in your heart? You know, and like not wanting other people to fail so you win, but wanting other people to do great and for you to compete and be pushed and do even greater. Like, Adam, you're a really heart centered person. Uh, and obviously, your dad is super competitive, and that's why he hurt his back in the first 11 seconds of pickleball. But where does competition openly, honestly fit in for you? Because I think sometimes people, who haven't lived a competitive life see competition, even competing with herself, as something like that's suboptimal. And I know you've lost like 17 pounds on some really intense challenge that you're in. Like, you know, just a quick 30 second version. Where does like competition fit in for you challenging yourself? It, it plays a big role. I, like you said, I mean, even playing yesterday with my aunt, my mom, and my dad, um, and my dad, you know, hobbling but trying to hit it over all four of us were really wanting to win and once we started keeping score you felt every the intensity go up and like you said though i wanted nothing more than to see my mom and my aunt play incredible but when we finally scored the seven to five victory i said you got you guys know i had to win it's just <laughs> yeah so but what does it, it mean to you like why what is competing why did you do this challenge and why did you lose this weight? Like you're in excellent shape. I didn't think you'd ever have the ability to lose 17 pounds. So why are you doing this? So very simply put, self-mastery, um, going through times in life where you find challenges and the best way to overcome them is to focus on building and, and growing the can I, uh, Tony Robbins, just the self-mastery aspect of what can I do to improve every aspect of my life? So the challenge that I'm on is not just a physical challenge. It's more of a mental toughness. Yeah. It's across yeah. the board. So that's, you know, that was why I, I decided to, to take it on. And, and it has been, it's been incredible in all aspects of my life. Yeah. And so brother and everybody out there, where is that for you? Because I, I will give you an unbelievably valuable self-mastery dynamic for me. I offer it to you. When I was in high school, we, didn't, we had a lot of success. You've heard me talk about our baseball team, football team, wrestling team. Uh, for those that I knew, we had a lot of high school success. Incredible coaches, mentors, and teammates. And something that I figured out very fundamentally, and then I would later hear about it uh, in Tony Robbins' language of like leveraging yourself is his language. But I was leveraging myself before I even knew the term leveraging myself. Because I would work, I would commit, and it's my teammates, we would commit to work harder than everybody else. Be in the gym longer and harder. We weren't the biggest team by any stretch of the imagination. We had an actually a uh, really small team uh, in terms of physical size. And we were committed to being like the strongest team though, no matter what we had to do. And so if I was on the football field, if I was in the, getting like in baseball, I would think of all the time I spent in the weight room, in the batting cage, and I would think this person pitching they might be throwing 90, you know, or 88 in high school or 95 in college. And, you know, and I did face a couple of guys throwing 95. That's super rare. I mean, that, that's like legit gas in the major leagues. And in college, it was unbelievable. And I, I remember thinking, like, after first at bat, we played Vanderbilt. My first game in college, Vanderbilt, who's won multiple college World Series now, had this lefty kid throwing 95. It was unbelievable. And my first at bat, I struck out in three pitches. And I was intimidated. It was my first collegiate at bat. I let off our season in 1989. And I remember thinking to myself, and I'm just being real now, like, F this, man. Like, F this. This kid has not worked harder than me. There's no way this kid has worked harder than me. No way he's worked harder than me. And so, like, I got myself out of my fear into simple, fun, and magical micro distinctions of how to get my self-mastery up. I knew the manager of the New York Yankees was watching the game. Uh, Jeff Torborg was named at the time. And I knew that because our right fielder was Greg, his son. And so I'm like, there's no way I'm being, you know, there's no way I'm not succeeding. And so my second at bat ended up hitting a triple off the 410 sign in center field on a slider from a lefty, one, like one-handed out of my front foot because there's just nothing else that's going to happen. 
because I was, I had gotten myself in a state of leveraging myself forward, thinking that nobody had worked harder than me. Nobody had worked harder than me. And there's no way that I wasn't going to be successful. So Adam, I think you're saying something same. And, and that's exactly what happened for me this weekend. Like I was there to represent for the world of blindness. I was there to represent for the world of unblinded. I was there to represent for my family and everything I believe in. And maybe other people are like, not, I'm very confident. Some people were there just to ride a horse because they were scared. And rest assured, I thought a lot about getting thrown off the horse. I thought a lot about all those dynamics. And I had never galloped at full speed on a horse in my life. And so sim like, simply put, at the end of it, I ended up having the third fastest time um, in overall for everybody there. So if it was you know, 75 people, then it was third out of 75. And I had the fastest time for the Tony Robbins Lions. And it was super fun because one of the Lions owns seven horses and rides every day. And he rode the first time and everybody's like, Oh my God, you know, like you look unbelievable when he did. Like I, I could see at least peripherally when he came in, he was just like masterful. And Milo, who uh, is a, a beautiful friend was on stage at um, Unblinded. He's, he had gone the day before and he was telling about the whole thing. He rode like crazy. And I was like, in my heart, I'm like, I got to beat Milo. And he was laughing. He's like, I know what you're thinking. You got to beat me. And I ended up Adam and everybody beating him by four one hundredths of a second to be the fastest lion. Um, and, and also the other guy, and you may go like, what's this all about? Why do we even care about this? Because it's that sense of competitive energy inside of us with ourselves and even with others. And yes, the highest level of mastery is to be completely self-motivated. I will lovingly say that I don't know a human being I've ever met who's achieved that highest level, like competing. I didn't want, and when that, that gentleman, Jim was riding, I wanted him to ride fast and do like brilliantly. Like I was rooting for him to do awesomely. And I just wanted to beat him. I want him to do great. And I wanted to beat him to represent. And the byproduct was an unbelievable feeling of accomplishment, certainly including because I'm blind. And a whole bunch of great outcomes came. And here's the interesting part. And this dovetails into leaders leading leaders. The speaker that night, um, the Saturday night that I was there, because I was there for 28 hours on this trip. And that 28 hours, oh, by the way, Adam, I also broke two clay pigeons and did a video of this online. Um, shooting a, um, a shotgun with like pull and shoot adapting and having the guide help me and support me in it. And we missed the first five. He had a track record of never in two and a half years that he's been working there ever have somebody not break a clay pigeon. Uh, it was far away. I mean, things up in the air. It's 50 yards away, thrown up in the air. And then we broke two in a row. And that's because we can, we can innovate and do anything. Like, dude, I'm, I don't say it a lot. I don't focus on it. I'm blind. I shot two clay pigeons with a shotgun that I couldn't see. I pulled the trigger. Like I helped, you know, aim the gun. Like he wasn't like, he was just like touching the barrel a little bit. And he was like, pull, I had to keep steady, do all those things. So we broke two clay pigeons in a row after missing the first five. Like, what can you do? Anything, like anything in terms of what we're talking about, ecosystem merging, speaking, sales, meeting sales. And, and you can lead leaders. You can lead leaders. So where does that go? So let's talk about the unreasonable. There's a guy, I think his name is Jeffy, uh, Jesse Eisner, or Eisen, like I forget his last name exactly. But he was, he was an ultra marathoner at 27 years old. He had created a, um, a, a jet company, he had no money. He went out and figured he was going to like find the finance, he was going to find a way. He did some of those innovative things, which I'll talk about later in the week, to get his first jet company client. And, and Adam took his company from zero to 500 million in revenue in like two years, like zero to 500 million in revenue, working with some of the most elite celebrities, sports figures, everything. And the guy started out as a street break dancer in New York, a street break dancer in New York and built a $500 million company selling to the elite of the elite of the world. And then he became an ultra marathoner. So this is a guy of immense self mastery. And now he's turning 50 and this is a couple years ago. And he's realizing that he can't get he, he believes his body can't, can no longer go past 38 miles. And he has to run a 100-mile marathon. So he ends up uh, connecting with this guy, David Goggins, who's a Navy SEAL trainer of just humans, totally out of his mind, right? Or what we think is out of his mind. But in fact, he's not out of his mind. We are. We are literally out of our minds, and David Goggins is not. And so Jesse calls him up. And goes, dude, I don't think you get past 38 miles. And he's like, hire me, bring me out there in two days. I will get you past 38 miles. He comes out and his first run, he does like 52 miles. 
And those micro distinctions we'll, we'll drop into later in the week in self-mastery, micro distinctions. But here's the key. Here's my key takeaway. It's about leaders leading leaders. David Goggins is who he is as a Navy SEAL and a trainer of people because he can lead leaders. And he led Jesse. And Jesse built a $500 million jet company because he can lead leaders. And so our barometer from this day forth in our influence mastery is going to be, can you lead leaders? And we start to talk about who's a nine, who's a 9.5, who's a 9.9. Let's look at which leaders are following your lead. Which leaders are partnering with you? Who are you able to lead? Because you could lead anybody. This guy, Jesse, was a street break dancer and built a $500 million jet company. African-American male in a demographic with immense challenges working with the socioeconomic elite, right? And if he could do it and I'm white and you're white, you could do it because there's a massive challenge, right? That it would exist in that space, which he alluded to as well. And working with some of like the, the world's elite, unbelievable example of possibility. And then he finds his way to self-master, influence, self-master, influence, mastery, process, mastery, genius genius, right? That sold this company for an absolute fortune, lives an unbelievable life. He found his way to lying to himself as he was doing something unbelievable. So we could sit there and go, well, we're running 38 miles. I mean, my God, at 50 years old, that's incredible. Beyond comprehension. The guy has done enough. He could easily have said that to himself. He didn't say that. He said, let me go find a leader who can lead me, David Goggins. He goes, I'm leading leaders. You know, I'm Jesse. I've led leaders. Let me go find the leader I can lead. And these, by the way, weren't his words. This is my words leaders leading leaders because we were saying influencers influencing influencers it doesn't resonate the same for me you can drop in do you like influencers influencing influencers more or leaders leading leaders more or leaders influencing leaders more because that's what we're doing for simple fun and magical micro distinctions and frictionlessness that free exponential abundance and money time and magic all david goggins did for jesse was come up with simple fun and magical frictionless micro distinctions that's all that were painful they were painful they were brutal in certain ways, but that's not how they phrased and language that I'm going to pause there for today. The, the, the dynamic of your acceleration is rooted in your influence mastery and your ability to have the process mastery and self mastery that has you leading leaders, partnering with leaders, leading leaders. And if your leadership is, is not optimized to the point where you're going to have folks that are um, more successful, partnering with you and following you, then your game is not find people who are weaker and, and will not do things and get things done, but they'll still show up with you. Go get leaders that will show up with you, right? And don't leave anybody behind, but go have leaders that will be led by you. Adam, any final, final today, as we yes. talked about the barometer being leaders with you. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. Well, number one, Sean, I mean, uh, you never cease to amaze me with your incredible uh, accomplishments over this weekend. I thought the, the bowling, the strike was, was amazing. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> top, you top both of those, but yeah, I love the leaders leading leaders for sure. And, uh, I also, <clears throat> now that you got up and you showed me that chair, I was absolutely did sit on it. I feel honored to sit on your grandfather's uh, swinging chair there. And I'm also honored to have the same name as that hero. So that Thanks. is my final final. No. Well, thank you and love it. And as this Mastery Monday goes away, we talk about magic. And I've, I've done this before on video. I, I've never done the huddle before. So again, I'm, you know, I stayed last night at my grandparents' house. Like, this is the wall of like what life looks like to me, right? And by the way, my grandmother very kindly had my picture from Columbia Baseball up there, large and everything, which is a running joke in my entire family. My grandparents, my grandfather had been 100 yesterday, but this is the wall of the memories. Like their children, their grandchildren, right? Their parents, like, this is the wall that's like a museum of the magic of my grandparents' life. And they were never financially wealthy, but the level of magic wealthy they achieved was beyond comprehension. So if you're new in this, you're thinking about like money, time, and magic. Like I'm sitting in the space, I own two beach houses and mine are a whole lot bigger than this, right? But I come here and I stay at times to be grounded to what they created. And with their level of financial abundance, which wasn't high, they figured out a way 
to buy this house, rent it out and pay for it, live in a small apartment in Jersey City after paying for the primary house, to build exa as examples of possibility for our entire family to go forward and create unbelievable magic. Perfect people, no, they weren't perfect. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, but they're examples of what's possible in creating magic, love, and truly, truly accomplishment in your family. So love you guys. It is Mastery Monday. You're a leader leading leaders. You are a leader leading leaders. The question for today isn't, am I that? You are that. Now it's a question of using your process, self, and influence mastery, heart-centered, integrous uh, influence mastery to make that a reality. Have a beautiful day. Thanks.